welcome to lesson four of this uh, civil rights African Americans 1865 to 1992 module and today we are going to focus on World War One, the Great Migration and the African American experience. This will take us up to around about 1918 which is where we will finish this little section of the course. You will need as ever your lesson notes template to help you with this lesson and to record your notes you will find that in class charts you will find that in the email that I have sent and failing all that you will find it in a Google Documents link in the description of this video okay let's start now right what's important to remember is that this civil rights course 1865 to 1992 focuses on not just African Americans but Native Americans, women, and trade unions and labor also. So this lesson and the one that follows which will round everything up will focus on the area which is highlighted here which is African Americans from 1865 to 1918. We will then pause our study of African American experience and we will move to look at Native Americans in the period circa 1865 to 1918, then women, then trade unions, and then we will pick back up with African Americans again from 1918 to 1950. This is preferable to doing all of African Americans, all of Native Americans, all of women, all of trade unions and labor, because it allows us to see some similarities, some differences, make some comparisons across the four different groups in the time period, and also um, for the depth study interpretation question which comes at the start of the exam before you have a choice of two essays that depth study investigation which looks at um, a particular historical debate in detail focuses on the Gilded Age which is around about 1870 to 1895 then it looks at the New Deal in the 1930s and then it looks at the 1960s so it means that we also deal with one of those depth studies um, during each little section of the course. So that's where we are and where we are going. Um, now let's have a little focus on what we've done so far on African Americans. Okay, so let's have a look at this table on page two of your lesson notes template. Um, which says what was the position of African Americans in 1910 so take that as a kind of circa 1910 around about that time that's roughly where we've got up to so far think about political rights so their their right to vote their ability to engage in the political process social rights think about um, their place in society think about segregation in accommodations think about their place as citizens in wider American society and then think about economic rights so think about their ability to um, own their own business, their ability to progress, um, their um, position in the wider American economy. You want to think also therefore after that about why that was their position. And when you're thinking about why that was their position, you've got across the bottom in red there some different factors that might help to explain why that was their position at that particular time. So you've got President, you've got Congress, you've got Supreme Court which are the three branches of the federal government. We've got anti-civil rights groups that we talked about in the last lesson. We've got African Americans themselves that we talked about in the lesson before that. And we've got southern state governments, which we talked about in the lesson before that, in terms of erecting the Jim Crow segregation system in both a de facto and then a de jure sense. So, in a moment, pause this. Have a go at jotting down what you can remember about what the position of African Americans was in terms of political, social and economic rights. Think about why they were in that position. Um, do it from memory first of all and then if you get stuck on pages 3, 4 and 5 you will find the revision note template overviews to help you fill in any gaps that you can't remember. So pause me and off you go. Okay, welcome back. Look, the important thing, and not to labour the point, but actually it is important 
that you have a good sense of this. The important thing here is to understand the way in which political and social rights were advanced very quickly at the start of this period, during the period 1865 to 1875, think about the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment, think about the Freedmen's Bureau, think about the Force Act, think about the Civil Rights Act of 1875, that really advanced the political and social rights of African Americans. And then we know that those rights were eroded from 1877 onwards through a combination of the federal government losing interest in the rights of African Americans, the end of Reconstruction, the um, prevalence of anti-civil rights groups, and the power of state governments, southern state governments, to restore home rule in the south and to um, erect a fairly comprehensive system of racial segregation. So that we know that by 1910, African Americans in theory have the right to vote, but that vote has been suppressed massively in southern states. We know that in theory, under the 14th Amendment, African Americans are protected as citizens and have all the rights of white people. However, in terms of their social rights, the Plessy versus Ferguson Supreme Court decision of 1896, saying that facilities could be separate but equal, and various Jim Crow laws around the South meant that black people were not equal to white people in vast areas of society. Economic rights, we know that the radical Republicans were less inclined to try and redistribute wealth in the South and to improve the economic conditions of African Americans. And so we know that African Americans largely were trapped in rural poverty in the South. There was the beginning of an African American business community. We know that the work of Booker T. Washington and the Tuskegee Institute helped to develop some vocational education and helped to develop some um, economic strength in the African American community, but that African Americans were still second-class citizens both politically, socially and economically by 1910. And it's important that you have that understanding in this period of some change that was quite radical and transformative, but that that was very quickly eroded because of the different factors that we've talked about. And in today's lesson we're going to have a look at World War I and then the beginning of the Great Migration, the Great Migration goes all the way up to 1970, so we're not going to go that far, and start to think about how the First World War and the process of migration may have impacted on these political, social and economic rights. Okay, so we turn our attention now to the First World War and the African American experience. You need to be on page 6 of your lesson notes template. And on page six, you will see a space to make some notes on the positive impact of the First World War on African Americans and the negative impact. What you are looking for here, um, and you're going to use the reading that comes on the pages after page six, so it comes on seven, eight, and nine, um, a little bit on at ten. You're looking for some of the positivity that came from African Americans leaving America and fighting in the war. They found uh, French racial attitudes much less restrictive and much less racist than white American racial attitudes. Think about the way in which some African Amer some African American soldiers were able to prove themselves in combat, but also think about the the racist assumptions of the American military, which continue to segregate black soldiers from white soldiers. Think also about the way in which moving movement of black people into white urban areas in the north and we'll come back to that when we talk about the great migration had an impact on race relations in the north think about some of the racial tensions that existed as black people moved into war industries in the north and think about the way in which african americans themselves du bois as a as the major african american leader in this period struggled with their their two-ness struggled with the double consciousness of they are both african-american so they are black but they are also americans and so there's a struggle between their feeling of a racial pride and wanting to protest against the treatment that they faced but also a sense of patriotism and wanting to support america in her war against the germans <laughs> 
So pause this now, read the article that starts on page 7 in your lesson notes template and make some notes on page 6. Hi, welcome back from that little spell of reading. What you should have hopefully got is a sense of the paradox created by the First World War. So in, in some respects, the First World War opened up some opportunities, some opportunities for African Americans to move into a different labour market, some opportunities for African Americans to go overseas. The, the hope that seeing America fight for democracy against um, the Germans and their imperial designs in Europe would help to illuminate a sense that America was not being democratic and was not treating people equally but that actually that was not the case and First World War just exposed uh, a lot of the racial tensions in the United States and it reinforced segregation and the problems that existed for African Americans. What I want you to do now is to have a look at this little clip uh, which focuses on the Harlem Hellfighters which quite perfectly encapsulates that paradox that I just mentioned at the heart of the First World War experience for African Americans. The Harlem Hellfighters was a regiment of New York National Guardsmen in the First World War. They were set up to fail by their own government. They were humiliated, degraded, uh, eventually given to the French army as a throwaway, and they ended up coming home as one of the most decorated units in the entire U.S. Army. Harlem Hellfighters are one of the most important regiments in American history. In World War I, they helped to establish to the entire world the power of black soldiers in the military. It was very difficult at that time for African Americans to get into the United States military because there was this perception that African Americans would not do well in battle. They had to overcome the prejudice of their own countrymen and yet also perform ably on the battlefield. Like so many units of African American descent, when they go overseas, they're not sure what they're going to do. Are they going to fight as infantry? Or are they going to be stevedores and load ships? Or are they going to be labor units and cut wood? And so they're committed to labor duty, they're unloading ships, building latrines, those type of support services. And as you can imagine, these men have been trained and they're willing to fight, they're ready to fight, and this is stressful for them. They were finally given to the French army, which in a way was an even greater insult because in the First World War, when the United States entered, General Pershing, the commanding officer, was very clear that American forces would not be fed piecemeal into the French and British army because the French and British wanted reinforcements. And Pershing said, absolutely not. When Americans join this war, they will fight as an American force under an American flag led by an American general dot, 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 except for the black guys. You can have them. Henry Johnson is perhaps one of the most remarkable black military heroes in US history. And he found himself in no man's land with Private Needham Roberts manning a listening post. And Needham Roberts hears, click, click, click. And he realizes somebody's cutting the wire. It's potentially a German raid. And so Roberts is passing him grenades, and they line up these grenades, and the Germans actually do come across the lines. Roberts is hurt, and now Henry Johnson is left to defend their position and to stave off this attack. And then he makes the mistake of jamming a French cartridge into his American gun and it no longer will work. And the Germans are on top of it. He then used his rifle like a club. And then he ended up fighting with a knife against the Kaiser's best and turned them. He's wounded in the fray. He's struck, for example, in the foot um, and has a debilitating injury as a result. And he fights them off, he says, for what seemed like an hour. The Germans ran shrieking into the night, all because of one man. It's not until the next morning that people realize what a tremendous act this was. They discover four bodies of dead German soldiers, 
And they also realize from the equipment and other things that are left behind that as many as 30 may have been involved in this altercation. As soon as he drove off those Germans, the French awarded him with the Croix de Guerre, a great honor. Unfortunately, it took about 75 years for the U.S. government to give him the Legion of Merit. Had he been white, he would have walked out of that war with the Medal of Honor. What was so shocking to me when I began to research the story of the Hellfighters was that after they had performed so magnificently in combat, the United States government actually sent a memorandum to the French government, essentially implementing Jim Crow, essentially saying, don't give them some notion that they are equals because we don't want them taking that notion back to the United States and demanding equality. When he come back to the United States, he's not awarded the Purple Heart. There's no notation in his military record of his injury. And so he winds up not being able to work because of this injury. He doesn't get any kind of assistance from the, from the army or from the government as a result. And he ends up dying in 1929 penniless. So it again shows the paradox. Here's this great story of valor and of courage on the part of the soldier. And ultimately, he comes back to a nation that doesn't honor that sacrifice. We tend to think we all know American history so well, but the story of the Harlem Hellfighters should be one of the first stories told. It wasn't about killing other people, it was about being Americans and serving their country well. That was the inclination of the Harlem Hellfighters. When you are African American in 1917, democracy is armor, democracy is a weapon. And to fight for a war to make the world safe for democracy was something more than just some ethereal crusade for the Hellfighters. It had concrete results. They were fighting for the rights to be a citizen of the country that they were born in. The documentary makes a, a good point at the end there that they, they were fighting for the right to be accepted as citizens in the country that they were born in. They were still, you know, half a century after and more, the um, 14th Amendment was still fighting for the rights to enjoy the what that amendment had laid down in the Constitution. And many African Americans in the South at this time particularly were beginning to think about how they could fight for the right to exist as citizens and were thinking about a better existence. And the war opened up the opportunity for this because of war interests in the North being short of labour. And it is in this period in the First World War that the Great Migration begins to happen. And what we mean by the Great Migration is a, is a huge movement of African Americans, six million in total between 1915 and 1970, out of the South and to Western and Northern urban centers. And what the rest of this lesson is going to focus on is the beginning of that migration process that happened uh, during the First World War and think about what that meant for the African American experience, what that means thinking ahead for us in the course uh, which goes right the way up to 1992 if we see the changing demographic in America so that the African American population is not largely concentrated in the South we begin to see a change. The feeling of, of many Southerners who embarked on this migration process is um, captured in a poem by Langston Hughes called One Way Ticket. I pick up my life and take it with me, and I put it down in Chicago, Detroit, Buffalo, Scranton, Harlem, any place that is north and east and not Dixie. I pick up my life and take it on the train to Los Angeles, Bakersfield, Seattle, Oakland, Salt Lake, any place that is north and west and not south. I am fed up with Jim Crow laws, people who are cruel and afraid who lynch and run, who are scared of me and me of them. I pick up my life and take it away on a one-way ticket, gone up north, gone out west, gone. So Hughes's poem captures 
that sense of leaving the South for something better, uh, leaving the South because of a, a frustration of what life was like in the South and feeling that the North offers um, something of a promised land, something better. There's a, there's a feeling in that poem that, that people just wanted to get out of the South. Now you'll see on your um, lesson notes template there's a place to make some notes on the Great Migration to look at um, some of the stats behind that, um, some of the issues of, of African Americans leaving the South because of protest and some um, some points about how the migration process led to a change in the African American experience. Um, so you're going to start to think about that now um, and listen to the information that you hear in the next few minutes and then pause and think about how you might complete some of those notes. So, the majority of the African American population lived in the South. In 1900 there were 8.8 .8 million African Americans in the United States. Of those 8.8 .8 million, 7.92 million lived in Southern States. In 1870, 91.5% of African Americans lived in the South. And that began to change. If we take it all the way to 1970, for example, that figure changes to 53%, which is a huge change in the population distribution of African Americans in the United States. We're focusing mainly on the period of the First World War. And during the First World War, around 330,000 African Americans moved north and west, places like Chicago, Detroit, New York, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh. They moved to places where there were industrial opportunities. They moved to places like Detroit, where there was a war industry. There was the beginning later on of a, of a manufacturing industry in cars. And if we take Detroit as an example, the African-American population of Detroit increased by 2,400%. In 1910, it was 6,000. By 1930, it was 120,000. In that same 20-year period, the total population of Detroit increased 300%, but the African American population increased 2,400%. That's a huge increase in the African American population. So we can see that there is, over the course of the 20th century, a massive migration of African Americans out of the South, to the North, to the West as well. And yes, in this particular part, of the course we're not looking all the way forward to 1970 which is looking at the first world war period and the first world war period was a significant stimulus for this migration because obviously with um, men away fighting in the war uh, with the industry of america being focused on the war effort there was a labor shortage in some particularly northern urban areas, although there was movement of um, black southerners from rural areas to urban areas within the south, but predominantly these industries were in the north. And we see throughout the 19-teens and into the 1920s and beyond with the development of manufacturing, the development of um, car manufacturing in Detroit, we see um, the need for labour and African Americans move north in many respects because of economic opportunity, the possibility of a better life, the economic prospects in the north were better than in the south. And so there's a giant pull factor which is um, a promise of something better, uh, something of a promised land in places like Chicago and Detroit. Now this begins to change the African American experience in some important ways. No longer are African Americans in many respects or many cases working in the south in rural areas but they're working in manufacturing, meat packing, uh, car manufacturing in the north. Now that brings with it 
some problems of race relations in the workplace, but in a different way to the problems that they experienced in the South. Obviously, there is a great push away from the South because of Jim Crow, because of the racial system of oppression that is in the South. So there's both push and pull factors that are explaining why African Americans moved during the First World War, and the First World War provides a stimulus for the beginning of this migration, which then continues long into the 20th century. And I think what's important to consider for the African American experience is that when we've talked about civil rights for African Americans in this course to this point, we've been talking really about the experience of African Americans in the South because 90% of African Americans lived in the South. Once the Great Migration begins, then we have to think about the African American experience in a more sophisticated and nuanced way because the experience in the North was not of de jure segregation as it was in the Jim Crow South, but the experience in the North was of de facto segregation, it was of residential segregation, um, there were still problems of racism and still problems of discrimination in the North, but these operated in a different way. However, it's also true to say that the rigidity of racial mores, that the rigidity of racism was not quite the same in the North as it was in the South, and so therefore there were opportunities in the North, certainly opportunities for African Americans to exercise their political rights in a way that there were not in the South. Not only that, but in the North there was the beginnings of a renaissance of African American culture and an expression of African American culture that was different in the North from the South. So now it's time to pause and use some of what you've heard to fill in that notes template. Okay, so you should have some good ideas there um, about the key stats to do with migration, to do with how African Americans left the South as part of protest, and also how that changed the experience of many African Americans, and for us, begins to change the dynamic of studying civil rights in America. And what you're now going to look at, or you're going to you listen to, is um, a talk by Isabel Wilkerson. Isabel Wilkerson wrote this book called The Warmth of Other Suns, the epic story of America's Great Migration. Award-winning book um, on migration from the South to the North and the West. And what Wilkerson captures, I think, is the importance of the individual experience that is tied up in these millions of, of people migrating over the period of the mid 20th century. It's this sense that some of the people that we, some of the people that we recognize as major African American um, popularity personalities I guess people who are famous people who've achieved great things this possibly would not have happened had their parents or grandparents not migrated so people like Venus and Serena Williams people like Michelle Obama other incredibly important cultural intellectual political figures in the African American community whose life was changed by the decision of their parents or grandparents to leave the south and migrate either to the west coast or the north. So listen to what um, Isabel Wilkerson says in this talk and consider how you might add anything to the notes that you've made already. Now at this point I had intended just to embed the clip of Isabel Wilkerson talking about the Great Migration and the power of a single decision into this video but the people at TED Talks said that I couldn't do this because of the copyright. So you will find on page 15 of your lesson notes booklet the link to Isabel Wilkerson's TED Talk. So you'll have to open this link in a new window and watch it rather than it being embedded in this video. I think what Wilkerson highlights is two particularly important things. One that I mentioned before the clip, this idea that some of the great uh, sporting political, cultural leaders of the African American community uh, of both the mid and late 20th century may not have developed the way they did had their parents and grandparents not decided 
to migrate from the south but when she talks about defecting from the south when she talks about escaping from the south what she's really highlighting is the brutal oppression that existed in the Jim Crow South, the sort of brutal oppression that we have looked at in previous lessons. And so we need to see migration as a form of protest. In a recent lesson, we talked about African Americans themselves and what did African Americans themselves do to try and advance their own civil rights. Well, everyday, ordinary African Americans, one of the crucial things that many did, 300,000 or so during the First World War, six million between 1915 and 1970. One of the things that they did was to leave the South, to leave the South and look to a promised land to somewhere different in the North, in the West, to just, in the words of Langston Hughes, just to get gone, to get a one-way ticket and get out of there. Now, as we will see later on in this course, the racial situation in the North had a dynamic of its own. It did not mean that you had escaped racism. It, the racism was not simply something that existed in the southern states of the United States. It, it existed in the north as well. And what you will see as we go through this course is that some of the experience of African Americans in the north differed from African Americans in the south and this brings a new dynamic to our understanding of the black freedom struggle and the civil rights uh, course that we are studying. Now on page 13 of your lesson notes template you will find a link to this article by Neil Evans called Red Summers. Um, we will touch on this when we pick up the African American experience again later in this course but it's certainly worth taking a look at this as a piece of extra reading. Just to illustrate the point that I've made about the fact that the racial situation in the North was not necessarily this promised land that African Americans who were moving from the South hoped it would be, in the aftermath of the First World War, as demobilized troops moved back from Europe, as the war industry wound down um, and white people went back to the, the traditional jobs, there was some fairly significant racial tensions, especially in northern urban centres, where white people resented the emergence of African Americans who had moved there during the war, and there were some horrific racial riots that took place in what Neil Evans calls the Red Summers um, in the year after the end of the First World War. So um, it's worth reading that just to just to get a sense of the fact that the First World War and the Great Migration, whilst in the long term had a significant impact on the African American freedom struggle, in the short term they provoked quite a strong backlash amongst white Americans and in this case we're talking about um, white Northern Americans as opposed to white Southerners that we've previously looked at. And so we have it, the end of this lesson on World War One, the Great Migration and African American experience. This also brings us in terms of content to the end of this little section of civil rights course that we've done first on African Americans from circa 1865 to 1918. The lesson that we do next time will draw all of this information together on Reconstruction, on Jim Crow segregation, on African American leadership, on anti-civil rights forces, and on the First World War and the beginning of the Great Migration. It will draw it all together and look at how we can synthesize this information um, to write an essay and have a look at the key trends, the key factors, the key themes and how we can weave that together. Once we have done that, we will then move on to Native American experience from 1865 to 1918. So, I hope you have enjoyed this lesson, I hope you have found it informative, and until next time, take care, stay safe, goodbye.
Now, on page 13 of your lesson notes template, you will find a link to this article by Neil Evans called Red Summers. Um, we will touch on this when we pick up the African-American experience again later in this course, but it's certainly worth taking a look at this as a piece of extra reading.